what we wanted to do was to give you all some sort of, some sort of an idea of what we actually do here at uh, uh, Ben Gurion uh, ben -Gurion <coughs> University of the Negev. Or more to the point, what the wonderful people sitting here to my uh, uh, side actually do in, on the, in their sort of day-to-day -day, uh, uh, activities. Because you, c you come as the Board of Governors and you see the university, but perhaps you, you know, and you get a feel for what's going on, and you get the vibe, right? You get the vibe of, of uh, uh, Ben-Gurion. But we want you also to know a little bit about what actually uh, uh, goes on and how people decide, how our researchers decide what they want to do. So I'd, li I'd like to start briefly by saying that uh, um, I'm, the, I'm the rector of, a uni of the university. Okay, now, rector is a rather strange name. And in fact, when I uh, um, wrote to a colleague of mine in England that I had become to tell him, he's, a, he's an Anglican priest, to t Anglican pastor, to tell him that I had become uh, uh, the rector, uh, he wrote back to me saying, and you did that without converting? <laughs> which, was actually had, which was actually quite funny because I, uh, well, he knew that, I think, and that was his double entendre, because I uh, have a center, or I set up a center here at the Ben Gurion University for the study of conversion. Okay, so uh, uh, I think he sort of played on that, but why is, why is, this, why is my title a rector? Okay, and this goes back, and this goes to the essence of the university. University is actually a very, very old establishment. Okay, and it goes back, and it goes back to, uh, uh, the idea goes back about 800 years to, and there's an argument among historians as to when uh, the universities were actually, uh, uh, which university was, what, which university was the first one to be founded, but we'll say around 1200, the universities were founded, but they were founded as church establishments. Okay, Jews were not allowed in, right? But, uh, and neither were women, right? So it was, it was, a, it was a male establishment run, run by uh, uh, the church, and pretty much the structure of the university as we have it here today, and all universities are slightly different, right? And have slightly different uh, structures, but the basis of the structures of the university were already put into place 800 years ago. Okay, so faculties already existed 800, 800 years ago. They were not disciplinary as they are, as they are uh, uh, today. They were mainly, they were mainly uh, uh, glorified boarding schools, okay? and, you, and you belong to a faculty according to your nation or where you, or where you uh, uh, um, came from. But faculties, as they were there, exist now. Deans, rectors, these are all church uh, positions. Right? These, are all, these are all positions in the church, and we have, as history, as the centuries have gone by, and universities have evolved, right? and now heads of universities are not generally bishops, although there are some universities where a bishop is still the, head of the, is still the titular head of a, a, a university. But as universities have uh, uh, evolved, we've sort of kept the uh, uh, names right, that are throwback to hundreds of years of development of uh, university and university uh, um, institutions. So my job, right, as was the rector's job, as is the rector's job in a church, right, and is, uh, uh, is basically to shepherd my flock, <laughs> right, to be, to be a, a shepherd and guide, and guide my flock to uh, a paradise. <laughs> Welcome to paradise. <laughs> Um, easier, said, easier said than done, but you sort of, but you sort of get the idea, right? The, the, what, was, uh, um, what, what was, what is in the church basically carries over into the uh, uh, university, and my responsibility is to the academic, the academic members of, the, uh, uh, of staff. We have, we have close to uh, 900 full uh, 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 you know, senior academic staff in, in the uh, uh, university. And one of my, or one of my main jobs, is to make sure that they're happy. When I say happy, I mean is to make sure that they are able to do their research to the best of their abilities with as little hindrance as possible. Okay, so I'm there to try and make sure that the wheels sort of turn uh, 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 smoothly. And together with the deans, right, the deans who again, right, deans, by the way, is a really interesting name. Dean, a dean 
uh, Dean comes from the Latin, right? Decan, uh, uh, decamus, right? Decamus was a uh, um, sergeant in the Roman army. Okay, and from that uh, uh, from that etymology, beginning from Dean, the Dean becomes starts as, out as being a sergeant, and then eventually ends up being a high position in the church, and therefore also in the uh, university. Right, a Dean who is the head of the, uh, uh, the faculty, and we have um, five and a half faculties here at the uh, 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 university, each headed by a dean who work with me within their own uh, 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 faculties in order to make sure that their researchers, the researchers in the departments that make up the faculties, right, will be able to teach, research, right, and do things to the best, to the best of, our, of their abilities. So we're a, we're a whole team who basically by the way, elected, right? which is also something very uh, 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 interesting. We're elected, we're elected by our peers okay? to help our peers do what they want to do to the best, to the best of their uh, uh, abilities. Okay? Our university is almost a comprehensive university, as I'm, as I'm sure you, you are well aware. Right? We don't have law. Right? If you ask Yossi Rockney, our friend sitting up there, it's a good thing right? that we don't have a, a, a law, law at the moment because, well, I'm not going to go into that because of why, but it would be, but it would be a losing, it would be a losing uh, a, a proposition for the uh, university. We don't have a law, we don't have a law faculty, but other than that, we are, we are a pretty uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, university and we're looking for ways to go in different and new directions all the time and that's part of the challenges that's part of the challenges that face us as we uh, uh, look ahead right, to the next dec decade and uh, uh, beyond. What I want to do today, however, in the short time that we have, is focus on the issue of how, not so much what we do, right, but how we do research. Okay, and how our researchers decide what they want to do, and then how they go about, how they go about uh, uh, doing it. Because Every discipline has very different ways of carrying out, of carrying out and doing uh, its research. Okay, for example, I'm a historian. Right? The first time I think I stepped into a lab after um, leaving school right, was when I became rector. Okay, so I don't need a lab. Right? My research does, in fact, I take that back. I do need a lab. But my lab is a library. Right? I go into uh, uh, a library. I go into uh, uh, archives. Right? I go to where um, ancient documents that sometimes people haven't read for hundreds of years right, are, uh, 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 are to be found. And that's my lab. That's where I, that's where I uh, uh, spend my time. But I have no need for a lab with lots of uh, uh, very expensive equipment and, uh, uh, and things like that. So we, we all do our research in uh, uh, very different ways. And this panel was put together with the idea of giving to give you right, um, a look right, or a small, uh, uh, insight, small insights into how, right, rather than what, how we actually do. And the what will come into it as well because we can't really talk about the how without the what. But we want to put the uh, 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 emphasis here on the how. Right? how we do our research. And sitting here to my side right, are three uh, um, wonderful uh, uh, colleagues of mine who I will uh, uh, introduce. No, they will introduce themselves. I'll just tell you their names. Okay, so uh, uh, here to my uh, immediate right is Orit uh, Vaknin Yukutieli, who is from the uh, Middle Eastern Department in the Faculty of the Humanities and, uh, and Social Sciences. She is also the head of the Chaim Herzog Center for Middle East Studies and Diplomacy, which you might have heard of, one of our, one of our leading uh, research centers. To her right is Ohad ben, Ohad ben Shachar from the Department of Computer Sciences in the Faculty of uh, uh, Natural Sciences. He is actually the head of the Department of Computer Sciences, one of the, one of the largest uh, uh, departments in the uh, uh, university. And to his right is probably the youngest in academic terms right, of, the, uh, uh, of the three, and is uh, 
Miriam Amiram from the Avram and Stella Goldstein Goren Department of Biotechnology Engineering in the Faculty of uh, Engineering uh, Sciences. And you should know that she is the holder of one of the most prestigious awards, grants, that, uh, we can, that, uh, we can, that academics can apply for, which is the European Research Council Starting Grant, right? which is a very, very, very uh, uh, prestigious and important uh, uh, grant, and we're delighted right, that, at your success, because right? your success also reflects, also reflects on the uh, uh, university. And what I'm going to ask each one of them, each one of them uh, uh, to do briefly, and if we have time, we'll open it up also for uh, uh, questions as we, as we go uh, ahead, is to first of all tell us right, what led you to become an academic and why you chose the field that uh, uh, you chose, or why you decided to choose the field that uh, you did. And I'll ask, uh, why don't you start? Okay. So, um, actually... Chaim was telling us how university is paradise, right? My dad told me that too. So he, he wasn't a professor, ironically enough, and I didn't catch on. But um, it was very clear to me because I learned about, you know, being in the university, satisfying curiosity, being a huge nerd, you know, <laughs> studying all the time, learning new things all the time. It was very clear to me from a very young age that I belong in academia. It was not as clear to me, though, what I was going to do. Um, I wanted to be, I was fascinated with the human body. I was fascinated with biology. At the same time, I wanted to help people. It was kind of natural that I would become a doctor, but I'm a germaphobe, hypochondriac. <laughs> so that wasn't happening. Um, and I was, I was really confused and, and misled and, and um, or... I just didn't know what to do, and I, I actually joined the economics and computer science program that had opened up. It was very prestigious. I knew I would get a job. I could choose between the two departments. And um, when I finished that, I, I even moved on to uh, graduate studies in those fields. And I worked, and, and it was clear to me that I was lost. I wasn't passionate at all. And I was looking to change fields. At the same time, the biotechnology engineering department opened up. And when I learned about it, and I learned that this was an opportunity for me to learn about biology, to learn about the human body, at the same time design new therapies to you know, help humanity and problem solve, which was you know, something that I'm passionate about, I immediately signed up to that department, started basically all over again um, from undergrad, uh, did my master's, PhD, postdoc, et cetera. It's a very, very long road to get to where I'm actually you know, sitting here and, and, and in academia like I wanted to be. Um, but, you know, it all turned out, and I'm, I'm fascinated every day now that I do work in a lab. Um, and that's how I got to sitting here and talking to you. Oh, hug. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my story is slightly different, but not much. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, so you must be uh, telling yourself, what's the big trick? Everybody wants to be a computer scientist these days. Uh, but in a sense, I'm a computer scientist ever since I was 13 or 12, something like that. Uh, it was the very early 18. Uh, 18th, and uh, I was a curious teenager, and I was lucky enough to have a father that would uh, spend um, a little bit more than the average on his kids, so I was lucky to get uh, one of the very first personal home computers at the time, very early 80s. Uh, anybody who is involved, maybe remember the uh, company Commodore Business Machines. <laughs> and I was lucky enough to have the VIC-20 at home. I'm not sure if anybody uh, is familiar with that machine. And that machine could do fantastic graphics, and it could do fantastic sound, and I was hooked. I was spending hours programming that tiny, well, it was a toy, 
Uh, it was a toy with the uh, memory capacity that you wouldn't even imagine how low it was. Today, when you open a Word document, it's already larger than what that machine had in total. So it was clear to me that computers and uh, uh, computer science is, is uh, something I would try to pursue. Um, and I think research was already, already on my mind at the time, uh, but university was still an unfamiliar term. Um, uh, in a sense, my reason for being here today is not because of my academic studies, and I had uh, uh, both my uh, bachelor and master's and later on my uh, PhD all in computer science, but it's the time of between these periods where I had uh, uh, my academic studies, five years between my bachelor and master's and another year between my master's and PhD. Uh, and you can imagine what I was doing uh, in that time when you graduate with a computer science degree, you go to earn money. Uh, that was uh, not the type of money uh, our graduates uh, are making these days, but it was still very respectable. But being in industry and realizing that even though you are designated as an R&D person, research and development person, you maybe spend 5% of your time doing intellectually uh, uh, challenging tasks, uh, that wasn't enough for me. Uh, so so I, it took a while after the bachelor degree uh, to come back to, uh, to a master's, uh, but uh, the year after my master's was very uh, convincing in terms of how boring it is in the industry. And uh, I rushed to do my PhD, uh, in my case, in the United States. But uh, at that point, it was clear that being intellectually challenged, uh, you, really want to, uh, uh, you really want to find your, your way into academia. Um, of course, you have to be, uh, and Mira can testify, everybody can testify, you need to be decent and over in your PhD research to uh, compete for the uh, uh, you know, small number of academic jobs in Israel. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to find one here, and uh, I'm here ever since. I'm sure that you spend far more than 5% of your time now on the, uh, intellectual pursuits as head of department. So that was true up until two years ago. <laughs> and hopefully that will be the case in, the, well, not too long. Orit. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to present my research. Uh, and my story is uh, quite different from my colleagues here. Uh, because uh, my chances to earn money were non-existent by choosing <laughs> the humanities. So th but that gave me the privilege uh, to do what really interested me. But it wasn't easy, because my path to the academia wasn't the common one. I started over again my career in the academia at the age of 33, having three children after having a career in environmental education. But during that period, I was active in NGOs dealing with the Negev and the society in the Negev, the coexistence between the Arabs of the Negev and the Jews, asking myself questions, or historical questions, about how do we live together? How was it in the past? How can we understand better the human conditions? And that, tricked me to study Middle East studies and to start in the age of 33, again, another career. I didn't, I, it wasn't obvious for me that I will end up being a faculty member or having a PhD. I just wanted to answer a few questions that bother me, to, to solve some of the dissonances that I had between my own personal experience, my own family, my, my family history, and the present that we are living in. Being a daughter of emigrants or olim chadashim from North Africa living in Be'er Sheva, 
growing up in an Arabo Francophone culture, I wondered what happened to the culture, why my uh, peers in my classroom don't have any ideas, don't know anything about this culture, why Arabic considered to be such a foreign language when we hear it all around us. And those kind of, of dissonances or tensions were in my mind when I decided to study in the Middle East department, which offers interdisciplinary studying of the Middle East, and I studied history and anthropology, because question of past and present always interested me. So when, when we deal with the past or ask questions about the past, actually, we are preoccupied with question of our present, with the concern that we have today, and the politics that we have to live today. So that uh, uh, drove me to better understand, to learn languages. I studied Berber language, the Mor colloquial Moroccan, um, uh, standard Arabic, German, and French. So, so many languages in order to write one book. <laughs> So Orit's last uh, comment basically began to uh, uh, indicate to us right, the differences in the tools that we need in order to be able to uh, do our research in the different uh, disciplines. So, following on from that, the, the question to, uh, to, all of, to the three of you is, uh, tell us where you work. What, tell us about your, uh, uh, what, if, if it's a lab, if it's somewhere else, tell us about the place where you uh, uh, work and the tools that you need in order to do, in order to do your work. It really begs uh, to comment that I too speak lots of languages, none of which you can understand. And this is important. Uh, but it also begs to say that even though I'm a computer scientist, I uh, work in a very particular area of computer science. It's called computational vision. Uh, if you will, that's the uh, field where we try to make computer, computers uh, see, and this, uh, well, have the uh, vision sense, and we, where we also try to uh, explain biological vision using, um, using comp computational tools. Um, so for that, my group, my research group, is essentially an interdisciplinary one where, where we don't only speak computer languages, we also deal with biological issues and, and, uh, and neuroscience and behavioral sciences. But to the question where, we, where I work, uh, again, not in the past two years uh, as a department chair, but, but as a researcher, uh, I do have a lab. And uh, uh, the reason I have a lab, unlike many computer scientists, well, many computer scientists do theoretical work, so they need essentially their table, desk, and uh, a piece of paper and a pencil. Sometimes a computer. Sometimes they need a computer, but not always. Uh, but some computer scientists, and I'm one of them, uh, we do need labs. And this is because um, we do use special equipment, and we do uh, run all sorts of experiments. Uh, and of course, we want our graduate students to uh, form a community, a small community where they can uh, help each other uh, forming uh, ideas and uh, finding solutions to interesting questions. Um, my lab, um, which is part of the computer science department, uh, serves exactly that. Uh, it does uh, host uh, a host of equipment uh, from special cameras to uh, uh, robots and custom-made machinery. And it also has the equipment to take any one of you and place in front of a computer screen and test your vision because we also try to understand that, uh, uh, that vision using uh, computational tools. Maybe I'll stop here. Miriam? Okay, so... I'll trump you all and continue the analogy. You speak five, ten languages, and you as well, that we can't even understand. Um, I work with biological systems. I work with bacteria, with cells, with mice. 
And I do feel like the, the still limited knowledge that we have, I don't completely speak any of their languages. <laughs> Yet, here we are. Um, so, um, I'm an experimental experimentalist. I do have a lab. I would not be able to do anything without a lab. In fact, when I got here, the very first thing I did was use uh, the, the money that the university gave me to buy a lot of equipment uh, so that we could actually, for example, grow bacteria cells, grow mammalian cells, uh, buy mice to house in our vivarium and pay for their services. Um, and we also have other equipment that essentially allow us to manipulate, because we're engineers, uh, we manipulate uh, biological systems essentially uh, to make them uh, produce better therapeutics um, and then test them, for example, in mammalian cells and in mice. So um, the first thing that I need, as I mentioned, is a lab. And the other thing that I absolutely cannot work without is students, graduate students working in my lab, um, essentially doing all of these experiments, um, working out all the details, and uh, producing the results that we need. So fo to follow on with that, so, and, uh, so how do you choose right, what things you want to, uh, uh, what topics you want to uh, research? Where do the ideas come from? Um, so for me, the ideas come from kind of my unique background uh, my PhD was in a certain subfield of biotechnology engineering. My postdoc was in another subfield of biotechnology engineering. And essentially, what I do, what I, what I research, the field that I'm in, is called synthetic biology. So uh, basically, it's a marriage of tools that allow us to study biological systems to some extent that we can understand what we do and then engineer them with synthetic parts. So we, we look at the tools that we have and we define the problem that we think we can solve. So things that you're all aware, like, I'm sure you all know, insulin is a drug that di diabetics use. It's actually something that was found naturally in our body. And what we do is that we take this natural thing, we add on synthetic components to make it better, <coughs> to make it work better, to make it last longer, to solve whatever the current problem is in this therapeutic or this disease or et cetera. So, so Arit, I sort of skipped you. And uh, where, so how do you, where do you work, right? And where do your ideas come from? So as uh, you mentioned before, our lab is the archive as an historian. And as an anthropologist, my lab is a group of people, an environment, a village, a town, a city. So one might argue that first we choose the places that we want to visit or live in, the most exact places, and then we decide what shall we study about them. So it's a I have to say that my, my PhD advisor many, many years ago, and he was, he was right, right, said to me, when you choose a topic for your PhD, first look geography. And then, and then decide, uh, uh, and he, he was quite right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so my work uh, is in the archives, which is, can be a very dangerous and frightening world. Because those annoying officials that wrote documents, politicians and others, didn't bother with my interest. They didn't file the documents according to the book I'm writing. And... That forced me to go over hundreds and thousands of files. And I have a lot, I, I, I criticize them all the time. How do you file them? I would have filed it better. But they weren't interested in writing history, right? They were interested in other things. And then I have to, to find the document I'm interested in by reading the archives along the grains and against the grains. It means that I, I have to follow the logic of the archive to understand it. And then after months, I'm able to find a certain document or even to decide to write about the archive because it turned to be the most interesting thing. And sometimes topics are by 
total serendipity. For example, I studied one subject. I went to look for organization, or workers' organizations in Morocco during the Vichy period, the, the collaborator with the, uh, the German that ruled France and Morocco. And um, I found a, a file of documents about Perget that was not open to the public until uh, just, it was open to the public a few months before I came to the archive. And there was a whole world about the French idea of anti-Semitism, about purification of society, about the ro uh, role of the Jews in Morocco and in France. And it wasn't my intention to write about it. But talking about uh, the, the dynamics bet between past and present, when I came back with these uh, files of document back to Israel, there was a huge debate about whether there was a Holocaust in North Africa or not, and should North African Jews uh, get compensation for, uh, for uh, being child, mostly child in, in World War II. So um, the, the archive, it, it's, it's a, like an adventure like a, a theme park for us historians, when we, we, we go from one subject to, to another subject. And then there's the question of how we interpret what we read in the archives, and how can we keep our, uh, I would say, um, intellectual integrity, but not um, uh, claiming that we are objective, because we are, we are never ob objective. We always read the documents through our own experience, agendas, and so on. And then how can I present it as a story that hopefully will interest you guys, and, and, and how should I tell it in a way that will contribute not only to this minor subject, but will contribute to larger question about uh, the human condition, and that's the challenge, and, and our resources are not e e expensive equipment. Our, our most valuable resource for me is time, is the ability to sit for months in a library, to go uh, to the archives, to travel and to talk with people about their experience, uh, experiences and, and interpretation of life. Ohad, where do your ideas come from? That's a tough question. Um, so when I started uh, my career as a, uh, as a faculty, uh, I was much more, uh, I would say, ideologist. In a sense that I had a clear research agenda and a clear subfield in computational vision, which I, which I thought was the most important, and I had to solve every conceivable problem within that field. Uh, and I spent about, uh, in my case, it's something called perceptual organization or uh, mid-level vision, uh, something um, um, uh, theorists uh, claim we all have in our mind also, and uh, it would be wonderful for computers to, uh, uh, to uh, imitate. And I spent about a decade uh, solving problems there, and the research questions I defined for myself uh, we're trying to uh, fill in missing pieces in that, uh, in that field. Uh, I have to say, now that I'm slightly older, I'm, uh, you know, I think it happens with age for everybody. I'm not as ideologist, and now I essentially try to deal with whatever I find interesting at that time. Uh, and uh, our field uh, offers infinite number of uh, really fascinating questions, uh, which, and I think we'll talk about that in your next question, if we are able to define them properly, uh, provide an opportunity for, uh, for uh, research uh, as we tend to do here in the university. So I don't know whether, I don't know whether you noticed or you, or you were able to uh, uh, put your finger on, on, on some of the things that, that were said here, but one of the big differences between the left wing and the right wing, right? Of the uh, uh, because I count myself here on the in the uh, on the uh, humanity side is that for Ahad and, and Miriam without students, their research won't their research won't uh, uh, happen. 
right? They can't do their research without uh, uh, students, whereas for uh, or it, and, in, and in many ways uh, 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 for me as well, right? We do our own, right? We do our own uh, uh, research, and our students, right? Our students, uh, uh, we encourage them to, or we teach them, or we uh, uh, give them the tools so that they can be independent researchers. Okay, one very big difference here in our fields is that Orit and I would probably not publish with our students at all. Okay, we publish, we, when we publish, we write up our research, we do it, uh, 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 we do it uh, uh, on our own, whereas Ohad and uh, Miriam, right, their, their goal would be to publish, right, to publish with their students, which brings me to, to, our, to our next question. Tell us about one piece of research right, that you're doing together with uh, your students. What most, what most fascinates you at this, uh, uh, um, at this present moment? Right? So um, I'm going to give you just you know, one example, and um, I'm going to try to uh, not, not go into uh, all of the details. But um, one of the major problems that we have now in uh, delivering therapeutics in, in, in giving medicine to people, especially uh, to those with cancer, is that the drug tends to go everywhere in the body. And I'm sure you all know and heard about the, the awful side effects of chemotherapy, etc. So one particular problem that we're working on uh, now with the help, uh, I should say, the students are working on now with my help is to target these drugs only to where they need to go uh, and not to where they would otherwise go in healthy uh, tissues and do damage. And one of the ways that we're trying to do this ultimately is to control where they go with light. So effectively to um, eventually externally control where these drugs would go by shining a light so to speak, literally, on where they need to be. Um, and that's uh, kind of a main, a main problem that we're working on, a very challenging one, but I think would be uh, very rewarding uh, to treat cancer and hopefully many other diseases. Ohad? I have to say that you are extremely cruel because what you're asking amounts to choosing which child you love more. And, and uh, all our projects are fascinating, so I'll, 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 I'll give two of them, okay? Two examples. <laughs> there are ask, more. Ask an academic a question, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'll, I'll be brief. One, uh, I'll, I'll choose examples from two uh, different extremes. Um, one is about cameras. Uh, every one of you um, uh, have a smartphone and there is a camera embedded in it and it takes pictures and maybe some of you even using it right now. Um, how can we make that camera, uh, I would ex exaggerate, uh, infinitely better without spending a dime just by using computation? Okay, so imagine that you would use your smartphone to... Uh, um, um, take a photograph during complete darkness or a uh, photograph of the skies uh, during the night or just having much more vivid colors uh, than it's already uh, uh, able to, uh, to do. Uh, apparently, you can do that without spending more money on hardware and just crank the numbers. Okay, so this is one project and and Chaim was reminding me, it, was, it wasn't, uh, I didn't plan to say that, but uh, the project that came out from uh, that research, quick research question, uh, in fact, um, uh, is now a spin-off company of the uh, university. Uh, and uh, somebody's trying to make a product out of it. And uh, another question that may appeal to uh, some people in the audience is what I call computational archaeology. Because computer science is not only about uh, uh, you know, problems that nobody cares about. Uh, and um, we sometimes help other disciplines also. And uh, one of the problems we work on is trying to make the life of archaeologists 
much, much easier in a sense that today they go out in the field, they collect lots of fragments, they come back in the lab and they try to assemble some artifacts. And sometimes you need to spend years, even decades, to assemble those artifacts. Just, just imagine that a computer and a robot can do that overnight. And let the, the true, the genuine archaeological uh, research continue without waiting sometimes decades. So this is another project. Okay, so you're moving slowly towards the left. That's why I did so. The, the, uh, and this is, this, is, this is a paradigm of what exactly it is that we do and want to do in the university, right? To break down, break down the barriers between the uh, uh, disciplines and between the faculties and see how, as a whole, we can be much, much greater than the, than the sum of the parts. Orit. Um, so I hope you won't be too successful and take the privilege of the archaeologists in going to the field and spend the... <laughs> All months. My husband is an no, archaeologist. No, no. His only vacation in, during the year when he go for excavations far away. And um, so it's right that we don't work on the same topics with our student, but it is more like a, a reader community, and we do work together. And I can, I can give one example for this. Uh, where in our department, the Middle East Studies department, we decided to put forward the, um, the study of uh, Jews in Muslim cultures, which we found extremely important in our time, and we work on it as a team. Everyone is doing his own research in his own expertise. The, the Ottoman is working on the Ottoman Empire. I'm working on North Africa other on Iraqi Jews, and, and so on. Uh, at the same time, we have a group of students working uh, uh, on issues concerning the Maghreb that we call Libi Bamarav. My heart is in the Maghreb, which is a reference to the famous saying of Yehuda Levi that said, my heart is in the east when I am in the far west. So, but we are looking from the east towards the West. So it's kind of a reverse, a poetic reverse. And uh, the students are dealing with the renaissance of Moroccan culture in Israel and Jewish culture in Morocco. So that's a, a, a group of students, each one working on a different subject, and I'm leading this, um, this research. So being from Middle East, Eastern culture and department, I have to show that I can negotiate better than Oad. So I'll present two more topics. And, <laughs> and uh, another topic that uh, uh, I study right now is the, the way the Moroccan talking, remembering, narrating the Jewish past of Morocco. In the last uh, few years, uh, the Moroccan were preoccupied with the Jewish past obsessively. In a certain point, most of the text on Moroccan Jews were produced in Morocco, not in Israel, not in France, as we will accept, not in North America, which is a, a, a very important subject in, in Judaic studies, but in Morocco. And I wanted to, to find out and to to learn and, and maybe uh, to challenge the reason that Morocco is studying uh, its Jewish past. And I found fascinating answer for this, but it will be for next time. Or you'll have to read the book. You, you said you wanted to talk about one more, but you're not going to? The, the marketplace no, is, uh, the Middle Eastern marketplace is... Uh... Just to see that I can, not... Ah. <laughs> Okay, um, actually we have a few minutes. If uh, uh, anyone from the audience would like to, would like to ask uh, uh, questions, or a question, you don't, you don't. Please. How much do we know about the um, relationship between the Grand Mufti of uh, Jerusalem and uh, Adolf Hitler as to what sort of plans they did or did not uh, have in mind. Do you, can you shed some light on that? They obviously had discussions uh, involving 
what should happen to the North African jury. So I'm just wondering what your research has revealed on that. Thank you for <laughs> that question. Um, so, if I may, I want to burden the, the, the discussion and, and to ask about the, the attitude of the Arabs toward the Nazis during, well, before and during the war, and how can we understand it? And um, my expertise, or I deal mostly with North Africa, so we know about the Mufti of Jerusalem, um, clearly and, and, and um, in, in a very direct way, uh, suggesting the Nazi collaboration with them in order to get rid of the Jews. But if we, and, and then we have an, a, an opposite story about Sultan, the Sultan Muhammad V uh, telling the French that if they will touch or harm even one Jew in his kingdom, that we'll have to deal with him. It was a kind of a threat, which means that for now we support you. We support you in the war against the allies. That was in that period. But for us, the well-being of our Jews is the key for sovereignty. So how Jews become a key of sovereignty, protecting the Jews become a key of sovereignty in, in, in one part, and then we have the story of the Mufti in Palestine. So it, I don't have enough time to explain all the complexities of the, the Mufti's discourse, but I can say with, that we found different and, and, and diverse reaction, uh, reactions to the Nazis from the Arab leaders and, and population. Okay, that was rather a very specific question about, uh, uh, and well handled, well handled. <laughs> Last question. In terms of the academic oasis of Beersheba and doing your work here and having your students here as opposed to ac other academic locations in Israel. Uh, who would like to challenge, who would like to take that on? Ohad? Um, well, Israel is small enough for that to be a negligible factor, I think. But uh, even if you discount uh, all sorts of parameters, uh, irrelevant parameters, I don't think we have anything to uh, make us feel different. Uh, students flock here. Uh, indeed, they flock and they come to uh, study uh, their bachelor mostly. Um, but at least in my area, in computer science, nowadays it's slightly more difficult to recruit graduate students all over Israel because the private sector uh, really is tempting. Um, so I don't think we feel any different than any other place, actually. Miriam, would you like to address that? Um, I can talk from my perspective, being relatively recently a student. Um, I think the... Oasis here is actually quite known for being a very pleasant, collaborative, um, uh, mindful of the students, you know, uh, we're, study, we're back, study we're life balance. We're back in paradise. We're, we're, right? yeah. <laughs> we are in paradise. It's a little bit hot here, but um, <laughs> so you might be confused with the other place, but no. Um, no, I think, I think many of the students know um, that coming to this university in particular would give them a, a more a whole student experience, a more whole student experience. Um, and and from, what, from what I felt and from speaking to my students, um, I feel it's, it's a huge advantage. I wish you every success. Thank and you. I remember uh, that when I was minister in the first Rabin's government, and Rabinovich, who was the mayor of Tel Aviv, was the Gizbar, was the treasurer of the, this government. 
And it was after the Yom Kippur War, and we had to increase the budget of the, the security needs, okay. and to cut the budget of all the other uh, responsibilities of the, of the government, education, social uh, institution. And uh, Rabbi Gomi said, we have to cut the budget of the universities. Because they, how do you say, they waste uh, the budget. Why they have a president and a rector? They don't need two, two, two leaders. So when uh, Rabin heard about this, um, he came to me and said, what do you think about rector and uh, president? Uh, so I told, him, I told them that we need the president to bring uh, budget, to bring uh, ksafim, how to say, money. 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 money for the needs of the, of the army. University. Uh, but we, we need the rector for the kisufim, how we should say in a, in English, for the kisufim, the, for the inspiration, for the different uh, aims of the university, which is, uh, first of all, research, and research needs money, and our kisufim is to uh, strengthen the research and make the higher education in Israel the best in, in, in the world. Thank you so much. I want to thank I want to thank you all for uh, being here for this uh, uh, hour, and, and particularly I would like to thank my three colleagues, right? uh, Orit, uh, Ohad, and uh, Miriam, who uh, gave up of their valuable time to uh, come and talk to us. And hopefully we'll do this again next year.